One Piece chapter 969. So I'll say that this is like a pretty interesting chapter and it seems to have a very polarizing reception. And I guess the community is somewhat in like a mild civil war right now. Now I know that all of us haven't been able to read it yet since it hasn't been fully released, but I assume that these sentiments are going to echo out to the consensus once everyone is able to read it. Now, you know, we have to remember that at the end of chapter 968, we weren't going to have like this big conclusion or this big satisfying outcome to the meeting of Odin and Orochi because there was a huge time gap in between Odin's Orochi in that moment. It was like five years. Now that we know the connective tissue, a lot of people aren't really happy with it because they feel that it kind of ruins Odin's character or even I've seen a lot of people saying that this is just straight up bad writing by Oda. Now, I don't agree with this. I think that it all makes sense and it's just kind of hard to swallow, honestly. I just think that this is more so representing the entire narrative of Wano and as well as just making a, uh, Odin out to be the tragic hero that he is because that's always what he was. Yeah, Odin lived an incredible life, but he's his end was very sad like the you know the latter portion of his life was tragic and that's what his character is all about as well as the overall story of wano so it's picking up where the previous left off with odin going straight at orochi and we were thinking like oh is this when kaido's gonna step in to save him and no it's actually a kurozumi family member that is protecting him with none other than bartolomeo's devil fruit the barrier fruit which is uh, pretty surprising here. And this is like the second instance of a Kurozumi uh, family member using a fruit that was already established in the current timeline within the story. And that also uh, goes into that old lady. It's revealed in this chapter that she is in fact a Kurozumi family member, uh, the one that uses Bon Clay's Mani Mani no uh, fruit. And we kind of assume that she was, you know, considering that she wanted to make Orochi, uh, you know, the, the, the Shogun. We assume that, okay, I guess she's Kurozumi. I know we all had, like, our suspicions, like, maybe she's CP, uh, Cypher Pole, maybe she's, uh, I don't know, someone from Rox's crew or something, because, you know, she was able to have uh, Shiki's face. And then this goes back to the question of how do they lose their fruits, because obviously they're going to wind up in the possession of Bon Clay and Bartolomeo. Well, I assume that maybe Orochi or, I don't know, Kaido, or maybe even the Scabbers at this point are going to kill them. I mean, I think it's more likely that the barrier dude gets killed because, you know, he's uh, he's a pretty good asset to Orochi here. But also, we have to remember that this was like over 20 years ago, and they're already pretty old at that point. So maybe they just die of old age. Maybe, maybe not, but they are going to die nonetheless. But let's go back to the barrier fruit because... Yeah, this thing is just as OP as we remembered it was. Uh, definitely one of the best paramecias in the series uh, because it's really getting one of its most significant stress tests it's ever had. Now, before this, its best stress test, I guess, was the King Punch in Dressrosa, right? Because the big question that we had is like, wow, how durable is this thing? Can it break? Will it break? And it never did. And right now, like, Odin, like, seriously testing this thing. We can assume that Odin is seriously trying to break this thing, and he's just ain't able to do it. And, you know, Odin's just as powerful as anyone. I mean, maybe he's not, like, top-tier Yonko level, but he's, you know, pretty close to, like, the top 10 strongest characters that we've seen in the series, just based off of his feats and his reputation. So if somebody as powerful as him, like, can't break this thing, then I guess this is just an unbreakable barrier which really makes it, like I said, one of the best paramecias in the series. But we will probably see the vulnerability to it. You kind of just need to catch this person off guard. Uh, and also, you know, there are other things that can pass through it since you can, like, hear Bar Bartolomeo talk and he can hear other people's uh, voice. So I guess sound can pass through it and stuff like that. So it's not, like, impervious, but it is pretty uh, ridiculously powerful nonetheless. So then it comes to Orochi basically making a deal uh, with Odin behind the scenes. We don't exactly find out what they say, but it's also revealed that Shinobu hears this agreement. So I assume that it's basically like, hey, you know, if you just play by my rules, if you just be like a dancing fool in Curry, uh, we'll let everyone live. You know, we'll leave you alone. We'll let you live in Curry. Uh, you, you know, you stay with your family, but you have to keep dancing. Because also, like, we see, like, those people that are supporting Odin, uh, they get shot 
like one of those dudes gets shot with a poison arrow and then we see Kaido appear above the capital. So it's like, yeah, if you try to, you know, cause any more ruckus or anything, Kaido's going to go out and just destroy everyone. And he clearly can because we saw how powerful his friggin' fruit powers are, or allegedly his fruit. And this is one of those developments that has really rubbed a lot of people the wrong way because they're like, why is Odin trying to make a deal with Orochi? You know, he can't be trusted. Like, this is unlike Odin's character. And I'm thinking like... I guess this kind of falls in place with where Odin would be in his life at this point, because before this, we saw that he was very selfish. He left Wano to go on his own journey to essentially find himself, to go on the adventure that he always wanted. He even came back and then left again. So I guess this is Odin trying to have some kind of retribution for everything that has happened, and because he basically... I don't know, in one way or another, allowed Orochi to take over because he left and everything. So, like, he feels that I guess it's his responsibility to maintain Wano as much as he can, considering, you know, what he allowed happen to it. So, if that means that he has to dance like a fool for five years in order to just keep, make sure that Curry and his immediate family and friends are going to be okay, then I guess that's what he does because it's like, you know what, I don't want to be selfish anymore. This is a small price that I have to pay in order to make sure that everything's okay. Because, like, if he decides to fight back, then he's just going to, you know, there's going to be so many casualties. Just like we already saw in the beginning, like, just people standing up and, like, being excited about Odin. Uh, they got shot down. That one dude got shot down, and then we saw Kaido. So he's like, you know what? Instead of just trying to fight back... Let me just try to mitigate and just try to just save everyone that I possibly can by sacrificing my dignity. Oh, and another cool thing that we're seeing in this chapter is when Moria went against Kaido. And we're seeing what young Moria looked like. I guess this is like when Moria was like a supernova or something. Looks very different than what he looks like now. Like he's not all weirdly shaped uh, the way that we see him in Thriller Bark. And then afterwards, he kind of just like is almost like in a normal humanoid form, at least for the One Piece world. And he has like a, a, a regular katana at this point. He doesn't have like a scissors. So he was, uh, I guess, very different back then. But we can also still see that he definitely still had his a his shadow fruit at that point. Because we could see the bats and stuff. But uh, it's also connecting that when he did fight Kaido, it was at Wano. So that just ties together all the storylines. Like he fought Kaido, lost, and then stole Ryuma and Shushui. So that's pretty cool how that all ties together. I, and it makes me think like Oda had this planned that far in advance. Because it does make sense. Because, you know, Kaido is confirmed to be here at this point. So, you know, it would... Uh, be the area and place that connects, you know, him getting Ryuma and fighting Kaido. So I think that's super interesting. Uh, but then we're coming to the end of the chapter and we see that Orochi has, you know, in fact, gone back on whatever kind of deal he made with Odin and he just invades Curry and he's like, I'm going to turn this into a weapons port. And uh, I already tried to strong arm Hyogoro into doing this, but he declined. And then uh, allegedly he's killing his wife now. And it says that he kills his uh, 16 followers, but I'm pretty sure they were still alive, or at least some of them were still alive uh, in the Udon mines, because that's also what ha wound up happening to Hyogoro. He got sent to the working at the mines basically for the rest of his life. So this is the moment when that happens, because uh, he's like, Kaido's probably going to kill him, but that turns out he doesn't kill him. He just forces him for, uh, to have labor for the rest of his life, and I guess that what uh, contributes to him shrinking in size the way that he has. And then, of course, this is the straw that broke the camel's back for Odin. Odin was just, you know, playing his part for the last five years, you know, making sure that everybody was going to be safe. But he's like, oh, so this is all for nothing. You're still just going to stab me in the back after I was playing uh, what you wanted this whole entire time. That's it. All right. I'm going to go after Kaido and Orochi now. And then we see him gathering the scabbards together. And then it ends off with them all about to go their final march uh, and basically have their own little mini war. And then I suppose in the next chapter, we're really going to see Kaido versus Orochi for real. Now, I doubt we're going to see like an extended fight. We'll probably see like maybe two or three clashes between them. And we'll definitely see him injuring Kaido, which is going to be incredible. And maybe it will give us more insight into uh, Kaido's weakness or just Kaido's vulnerability at all. Uh, but then, unfortunately, maybe the next chapter after that, we will see the death of Odin. And people always question, like, you know, is he going to be boiled? Why do we think that he's going to be boiled? Because back in Zo, uh, when it's like uh, just the voice of the flashback of him dying, he was like, I am Odin. I was born to boil. So that makes us think that, like, 
uh, Orochi is gonna like dip him in like a boiling vat or something and that's how he dies. So I guess that's kind of like Orochi sick joke on him. And Odin dying in the first place is also lining up with his mentality in this chapter because he's sacrificing himself so that the scabbards and the rest is involved in this plot can live because that's what was also revealed too like uh, Odin gave his life so that everybody else can live so it makes sense that he's going to do the dancing fool thing in order to save everyone uh, at all so that's pretty much it for the review guys let me know what you think about this chapter are you upset with how it turned out for Odin or did you just know that this was going to happen uh, and you're okay with it but if you liked it, please give it a like. I also have a Patreon. It gives you access to a weekly Q&A. And if you haven't already, please subscribe as well. Have a great day.